Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. An Arizona delegation is heading to Mexico City to open a trade and investment office. And in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, Arizona Opera brings the world's first mariachi opera to the stage. Straight ahead on Horizon. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Arizona is expanding its presence and investment in Mexico by opening an investment and trade office in Mexico City. The Arizona office in Mexico City will be led by the Arizona Commerce Authority in partnership with the City of Phoenix. Joining me to talk about this are Sandra Watson, Arizona Commerce Authority President and CEO, and Kate Gallego, Phoenix City Councilwoman for District 8. Thank you both for joining us here on Horizonte. Um, uh, first of all, Councilwoman, uh, uh, your particular district, what's your particular interest in this trip? You're going on the trip. Mm -hmm. What are you going to be talking about? I am particularly interested, I represent the airport, and I'm particularly interested in our investments in, in tourism in addition to economic development. So I will be the lead uh, elected official on the tourism track. We'll be promoting Arizona as a destination, working with our airline partners to make sure that people can easily get between Arizona and Mexico. We'll also be working with Brand USA, which promotes the United States in Mexico to make sure they're aware of everything we have to offer in Arizona and the city of Phoenix in particular. I have the pleasure of representing the convention and visit the convention center, and we want to get as many people as we can to, if they want to book trade shows or otherwise visit. The more that I think we can get them to Phoenix, they'll like what they see and they'll continue to invest in Arizona. How important is this to Phoenix in particular and, and Arizona in general? Well, our mayor, Mayor Greg Stanton, has a very ambitious agenda on our relationship with Mexico. He wants to double exports in five years. He likes to think big. This was one of the biggest things he announced at his State of the City agenda. And so we're really hoping this will be a major job creator for us in the city of Phoenix. When we visit our local businesses now, um, we are regularly talking to them about the opportunities to expand their exports to Mexico. We can help them with, in partnership with the Commerce Authority to navigate the political climate there, to understand the markets, the growth in the markets. Goldman Sachs is pre predicting that by 2050, Mexico will be the fifth largest economy in the world. They're on our borders. We have to take advantage of this. It's smart business. It's smart politically. It's great for both Arizona and Phoenix. So, Sandra, uh, this is not the first time that uh, the state of Arizona or some of its cities have had a presence in Mexico City. What's different this right. time? Well, as you know, um, having been involved in commerce, the Department of Commerce for many years, um, the Arizona Department of Commerce did have a presence in Mexico, um, and we have had a presence there since the mid-90s. Um, the difference here is we've always had a presence. We've always had someone very much focused on Mexico. Um, the difference here is we have a very strong, unified, collaborative effort. Um, we uh, served the entire state, uh, the, the partners within the state with the previous efforts, but this now is uh, a very strong, unified, uh, collaborative effort by the state of Arizona, the city of Phoenix, uh, a number of other partners, MAG, um, Visit Phoenix and the city of Tucson are also uh, financially contributing to the overall office. Um, so the difference is that the, we're just strengthening, we're going to continue our presence and we're strengthening and building on what we've done in the past and continuing to have a very active voice in Mexico. The, also the, the, the difference from uh, the previous efforts is that we have more people on the ground in Mexico. So uh -huh. we have a, an entire team that is focused on delivering um, uh, services to companies both in Mexico and in Arizona to encourage the uh, joint relationships and partnerships. So how many people in the Mexico City office and, and what will they be doing and, right. and who's the customer base actually there? Right. So we have hired Market One to staff our operations in Mexico City. Uh, the office is to um, it, the office that we're setting up supports the entire Arizona effort as well as the city of Phoenix effort in, in Mexico as a whole. 
uh, but they will be based in Mexico City. And so we will have a the the CEO of uh, Market One will be active in um, our efforts, as will a program manager, a project manager, and so we'll have several key uh, staff people actually performing the functions of the ACA, but in Mexico. Um, so the ACA offers um, opportunities for businesses to expand their operations here in Arizona. So we want to make sure that we're talking to Arizona businesses and their opportunities to export to Mexico, create opportunities and joint partnerships. We're also looking for investment opportunities from Mexico. So those companies who are interested in setting up a presence in Arizona, we're also going to be very active in, uh, in pursuing those opportunities. The last piece uh, that I really do want to mention is that we are also very much focused on the the startup community and innovators and the commercialization of technology. So there's substantial efforts in Mexico as well as here in Arizona. We want to make sure that we're developing opportunities for Arizona companies to connect with innovators in Mexico as well as innovators to connect with businesses in Arizona. Councilwoman, uh, any concerns about the image that Arizona, <clears throat> at least in the past, has had in Mexico and how you convince people to come here? Well, that's one of the things we hope to do is dispel stereotypes that aren't accurate by showing how much we are investing in Mexico and how much we care. This is the mayor's ninth trip. We're going regularly. We're saying that this is a priority. We value our border with Mexico and we think they're our most important trade partner. So we want to make sure they see the political support on both sides of the aisle. So this will be a bipartisan delegation and we will, we will answer any questions they have if they have concerns. But we really want to welcome them, and this office is a physical sign of how much we value that relationship. Now, now what about Phoenix versus the rest of the state? Because I think people um, uh, consider Tucson a natural destination for Mexican tourists, Mexican shoppers, and so forth. How do you convince them to make the further journey to Phoenix to partake of, of what may be available here? Well, we're hoping to have this uh, ability to market our destinations, to tell them about our wonderful park system, our convention system, our great events like the Super Bowl, which has attracted a lot of interest in Super Bowl in in Mexico, and we'll be partnering with Brand USA, who promotes our entire country, to also make sure they're aware of what we are doing in Phoenix. To catch and, and how important is the tourism aspect? It's very important. Um, we partner very closely with the Arizona Office of Tourism. They're part of this delegation. Um, and uh, the tourism industry and the tourism opportunities are very important and generally lead to some kind of economic development opportunity. So the important, um, the important uh, efforts that the tourism community brings to, to this, um, we'll, we'll be able to continue to build on. So there are business decision makers who uh, first um, come to Arizona as tourists. Now, what about the delegation, the makeup of the delegation generally? Who's going on this trip? Well, we have a large delegation. We have uh, about 70 people that are part of this delegation. Um, it is being led by uh, the Arizona-Mexico Commission, the Arizona Commerce Authority, the Arizona Department of Transportation, the Arizona Office of Tourism, the City of Phoenix. So we are the uh, primary sponsors and partners of the of the visit. In addition to our entities, we also have included the chambers. So various chambers are joining us. Um, we have representatives from uh, Meg and some other entities. The speaker, uh, speaker, speaker Andy Tobin, will be joining us as well. And so we'll have members of the legislature also as part of that delegation. So it's a very large delegation. We're very excited about um, the discussions that we will be having with those officials in Mexico. So prior to the opening of the office on the 7th, we actually have uh, a very uh, strong agenda in meeting with business leaders as well as elected officials in Mexico to talk about business opportunities. Uh, we also have um, the opportunities, as was mentioned, on the tourism side. And then we have a, another track that is led by John Halikowski, the um, director of the Arizona Department of Tr uh, Transportation, that will really focus on infrastructure and the opportunities uh, that uh, Arizona has with Mexico in building out our infrastructure. How much is this going to cost on an annual basis? 
The overall budget for the office currently is about $435,000. Uh, $300,000 is coming from the state and, uh, and $75,000 is coming from uh, the city of Phoenix, a strong partner uh, in this effort. And then we have our remaining financial partners are MAG, uh, the city of Tucson, and Visit F Phoenix. Now, um, as it was just mentioned, you, the city of Phoenix is one of the big funders mm -hmm. for this effort. Um, budgets are very, very tight. How do you justify the expenditure of those kinds of dollars for this effort? We really want to make sure we're growing our economy and our exports. One of the things we learned from the downturn in the economy was that we cannot be overly dependent on real estate. So we at the city are feeling that you cannot waste a good crisis and we really need to learn. We need to look beyond our borders and we expect this to be the best $75,000 we're spending because of the economic development potential. It's a huge market. And if you look at uh, neighboring communities such as Utah, the state of Utah has been growing their exports during a time period when ours at the state of Arizona were shrinking. They're a smaller state. We need to compete. And if we have this physical presence, it will help us be competitive. It will ensure we are making, sh our, making sure our companies are in front of consumers in Mexico and that they know what we're doing in Arizona. So we think this will really help us, particularly at the city of Phoenix in the export area. So money well spent? Money well spent. Good. Thank you both for joining us on uh, Horizonte and, and travel safely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website, too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Here at Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. In Sounds of Cultura SOC, Arizona Opera brings the world's first mariachi opera to the stage. Cruzar la Cara de la Luna blends the artistry and passion of mariachi within the story of a Mexican immigrant family. We'll talk about the opera in a moment, but first, here's what you can expect to see during Cruzar la Cara de la Luna. Joining me now to talk about Cruzar la Cara de la Luna are James Garcia, Arizona Opera Community Liaison, and Ryan Taylor, Arizona Opera 
General Director, gentlemen, thank you for joining us on thank Horizonte. Um, the words opera and mariachi, I don't think I've ever seen together in a sentence before. How did this happen? It's a, it's a pretty fantastic mashup of the two art forms. Uh, Houston Grand Opera uh, commissioned this piece in 2010, which was the premiere. Um, and uh, they have a section of their company called HGO Co that's dedicated to finding the next great American opera stories. And they do that by going out into the communities uh, all throughout Houston and uh, sort of encouraging people to tell their own personal stories. So this is actually based on uh, a real story of a gentleman whose family they met. Uh, and they put uh, Mariachi Vargas together with the uh, stage director, Leonard Foglia, who wrote the book and created a piece, workshopped it over uh, several years' time, and created something really magical. And James, we, we say mariachi. This is not just any mariachi. This is Mariachi Vargas, the most famous mariachi in the world. Right. I mean, the roots of mariachi uh, trace back to the 19th century in Mexico and have a mix of, of, of Spanish music, of course, because of the tradition of colonialism, as well as native music, native, uh, uh, native Mexican music. And it's this blend. Uh, but Mariachi Vargas, as an organization, some pictures of literally stretches the, back to 1898. Uh, and they were a somewhat regional or, uh, band until like the mid-30s when they were sort of discovered, if you will, by President Lázaro Cárdenas. And so they are the premier mariachi group, perhaps in Mexican history, and they are part of this opera. It's really quite astounding. And how did they get involved? Uh, you know, from what I understand, uh, the opera recognized it was a story that needed to be told uh, in a different way than with classical orchestra and, uh, and operatic singing by itself. And uh, they reached out to Vargas to see if they'd ever consider composing a piece for the operatic stage. It hadn't occurred to them yet, but the styles of vocalism are not dissimilar uh, between mariachi and, and opera. So uh, I think for them it felt like an exciting project and uh, they were happy to jump on board. And I so, so we have these stereotypes of opera as kind of a, <laughs> an old fogey, you have, you have the quote unquote fat lady singing up on the stage in, in Italian yeah. or, or some other foreign language and you have to have subtitles to, mm -hmm. to understand it. Uh, how are you convincing people to go to this? Well, I, I think first, uh, you're talking about uh, stereotypes of traditional opera performing. Uh, but in order for you to understand how far those are off, you have to at least come and visit us once. Uh, I, I would dare you to sort of find the stereotypical what you think of as an opera singer on our stage. Nowadays, they're incredibly lithe, vibrant young performers that look in many cases like they belong in Hollywood. And it doesn't mean that we don't have artists of all shapes and sizes, but the stereotypical image of when you go, you will see this is, is not accurate any, any longer. With this particular piece, I think just the curiosity factor of being able to see how you would combine these two art forms, uh, as you said at the beginning of the interview, the words mariachi and opera together, how does that work, uh, is, is sort of driving a lot of the interest in the piece. And James, you interviewed one of the main performers in, in this opera. Uh, didn't you have that kind of same sense of, you know, how, how do you make this work? Well, it, not so much, only because um, I had long uh, thought of the idea of mariachi being operatic, a certain quality about it. And in fact, as, as a playwright, I have a play that is not an opera, but is a piece called um, Por un Amor, an operaci in one act. Uh, that deals with mariachi music, the traditional mariachi music. And so I'd had that connection. But when I heard Cecilia Duarte sing it, uh, I was moved really to tears because it was clear that here we were taking the genre of opera and, 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 the, and the, the quality of sort of that vocalism uh, and melding it with the traditional uh, cultural links to mariachi in a way that I'd never heard before. Uh, and that's what I think when people come, they, they will be surprised across the board, but surprised in a very good way to hear what they're going to hear. So let's talk a little bit more about the story that's being told here. Opera is, is about stories, and we'll, as we're talking, we're going to have some pictures on the screen um, uh, kind of illustrating some of, some of the, the scenes. Tell us about the stories. I understand it, it spans several generations of, of a particular person's life. 
It does, and uh, it, it sort of tells the story of a, a family that is separated by the border. Uh, it tells the story of an, an immigrant who's come to the United States, marries into an American family, uh, and as he is in his advanced stage of life, um, brings both sides of his family together and tells uh, stories and recollections about his experience and what what that has been like uh, growing up sort of uh, being split between two nations. And uh, the most fascinating part of this piece for me is to read the reactions that it's received from Paris and And I take it for Chicago example in, in, in the scene we've got up on the screen, that, that kind of shows what, the crossing of the border, the family Yeah, that's the, that's the moonlight of, uh, of the journey uh, between the two countries. And, um, and it's and pretty powerful uh, stuff. Explain the title, Crossing the Face of the Moon. Yeah, I, you know, I actually can't speak to the title so much as the idea that uh, the moon is the same no matter where you are in the world. Uh, and I, I think to find a piece that uh, speaks to a journey, uh, both physical and uh, mental and through time, uh, stands against the face of the moon in a, in a sort of really interesting way. Now you mentioned Paris. Mm -hmm. This has been performed in Paris, France? It has. We will be the fifth uh, company to produce the piece. Uh, it's been in Chicago, San Diego, Houston, and Paris. And uh, to find people, even among my staff, from uh, whose families are from Japan or from England, who've said, you know, this is not my family's story, but the similarities in what we deal with as an immigrant family are so uh, common that uh, we understand the piece in a, in a pretty deep way. James, uh, any political significance? Well, particularly in Arizona, which has been described in the past as ground zero for yeah, the immigration Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I want to speak to that because uh, I, I don't actually work for the opera. I, you know, I, I don't have an affiliation with them uh, because they have a black box theater and I'm a playwright. But um, the reason I'm attached to this and the reason I've been talking this play, uh, opera up so much is because it is a story that is perfect for this time. I mean, we've gone through some ugliness. We're in a period in which we need to let the community know here, not just the immigrant community, but the Latino community, the broader community, and we need to let the country know that there is, uh, a, this is a time to bridge communities. And, that, and that's what this, metaphorically, really, this story is about. It's about bridging communities across the border. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really moved by the fact that the Arizona Opera uh, is not just presenting this uh, piece, but opening its season with it and sending a message that not only should we value the contributions of immigrants in Arizona, but that it should be part of sort of the full breadth of what art is in the state of Arizona. Uh, and, and, and it moves me on a lot of levels because it's sending a very clear message that um, we don't want to be seen as a state that somehow um, is intolerant towards uh, this community. And Ryan, as, as James said, the Arizona Opera isn't simply presenting this piece. You're actually doing some other things as well. There's some educational components. We are. We begin uh, Monday night of next week with uh, a, a week-long festival of heritage uh, events, um, a panel discussion one evening on uh, the role of the arts in curating this continuing dialogue about immigration and cultural exchange. Um, we also have a... Uh, an, a former ASU professor who's coming in to talk about the tradition of mariachi and how are the costumes made and why are the instruments uh, different from what you might see in a classical orchestra. Uh, and there's a sort of lecture demonstration aspect to that. We have one evening that's the cultural exchange where we have all kinds of uh, folks who've developed arts and crafts uh, out of their cultural background. Those will be for sale uh, in an environment where we'll be presenting local mariachi and ballet folklorico groups. Um, and, you know, we have a student night at the opera that we're bringing, I think, about 1,400 kids in to see the show that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to do so. So uh, all that combined with the fact that we were, are the first company to present it, uh, not only to open a season with it, but to include it in uh, our subscription season. So uh, if you're subscribing to the opera this year, you're going to be in the same place as any single ticket buyer who's taking advantage of this really unique opportunity all at once. And so we're blending old and new audiences at the same time. And, and James, what is the role of the arts, of these kind of traditional arts, in, in, in addressing these kinds of issues? You're a playwright, a noted playwright. You, you, in fact, you just finished uh, uh, one of your plays, typically political satire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How does this work? Well, it's, it's a bit cliche, but 
you know, art is always a mirror. It's always a mirror. It's, 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 it's created because as artists, you're absorbing what's happening around you, whether it's on a local, regional, national, international level. It's sucked into your brain as an artist. Uh, and I think that this piece, uh, one of the reasons that, that I think it's going to be so powerful for people in this audience is in part because we've gone through some experiences that are directly interpreted through the storyline of this of this play, and that can be political, it can be cultural, um, but it's but it's going to be a powerful story to the audience because it's reflecting what has been happening in our country in this part of the country. Ryan, we're almost out of time. Uh, this is not the only thing that Arizona Opera is doing to kind of expand the traditional audience. Just tell us quickly what. what yeah, we doing. we were able to launch uh, about a two weeks ago now, a brand new four-year uh, community-based artistic initiative um, to present a couple of works each year that are specifically geared to new and different audiences than we typically uh, serve uh, at the opera. So uh, we have pieces uh, f specifically for the Hispanic community like Florencia and El Amazonas, which will come in two years' time. Uh, we're looking at, uh, that piece was written by Daniel Catan, um, who recently passed, but one of the biggest sort of celebrated Mexican composers for opera. And then also looking at a premiere of Frida and Diego. So, so there's a lot to, to look forward to. And, Absolutely. And, and this sounds like an exciting start. Thank you both for joining yeah. us on you. Horizonte Thank to talk you. about it. And that is our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte and 8. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.